This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Hi, I'm Rebecca Larson, and welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. With this podcast, I share a variety of stories from the most well-known dynasty of them all, the Tudors. From simple stories about the people of the time to the drama that was the reign of Henry VIII. And of course, politics. This show is presented to you commercial-free thanks to my wonderful patrons. If you'd like to help, you can do so by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click Become a Patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can help keep this show commercial-free. He was the longed-for son of King Henry VIII by his third wife, Jane Seymour. But he is arguably the least talked about Tudor monarch, King Edward VI. I know in part one, I stated that the next episode would complete his life story, but I took a slight detour instead. Find out where history will take us when we return. But first, a little music to remind us that we are talking about the Tudors today. Welcome back. It was at Westminster that King Henry VIII took his last breath. He had reigned in England since his father's death in April 1509. When he came to the throne, he was a young, athletic, and by all accounts, attractive man. The man Henry VIII was just before his death in January 1547 was much older, obese, and smelled of leg ulcers. Not the catch he once was. The king's legs eventually became so swollen and his pain so severe that he had to be carried around room by room in a chair. I often wonder, like, how many men had to carry him? What did the chair look like? After a quick Google search, this did not render any results for me. So if you know anything about the chair and how many men it took, please let me know. Okay, so not only did Henry VIII have swollen legs, but as I mentioned earlier, he had an issue with leg ulcers. He had more than one, and they smelled of bacteria-infested pus, because really, that's what it was. I do honestly feel bad for him. It sounds awful. Now, using red-hot irons, the doctors would regularly cauterize the king's ulcers to close the wound. It's no wonder why he was so cranky and unruly. So anyway, Henry VIII had been sick in bed for a while and had decided to finalize his will. The will was dated December 30th, 1546. It was signed at the top and at the bottom. Historian Susanna Lipscomb states in her book, The King is Dead, that Henry had not signed his own name since September 1545. So it comes as no surprise that a stamp had been used on his will. So now that brings us back to Edward VI. Three weeks after the death of Henry, the titles warranted, per his will, were delivered to its recipients who included Edward Seymour, William Parr, John Dudley, Thomas Risley, Thomas Seymour, Richard Rich, William Willoughby, and Edward or Edmund Sheffield. On that Thursday after the late King's burial, on the 18th of February, 1547, all the temporal lords gathered at the Tower of London, wearing their robes of estate. Leading off the ceremony was Edward Seymour, Earl of Hartford, and Lord Protector. Oh, and uncle to the king. He was wearing his kirtle and was led from the council chamber to the king's presence chamber with all pomp and circumstance. If you're like me, you're probably asking yourself, what is a kirtle? With the help of my friend Susan Abernathy, she helped me to visualize it a bit better. A kirtle was like a gown, a short gown for men. We might compare it to a tunic. Under it, they wore tights. The portrait of Henry VIII with his barber surgeons is a perfect example of a kirtle. 
Now, in my subsequent article, I'll include images pointing out their clothing items with descriptions so that I'll help you imagine all this a little bit better. As Edward Seymour entered into the king's presence chamber, he was led in by the officers of arms in their coat of arms, two by two. A little side note, one of the functions of these officers was to arrange and participate in ceremonies of state. So back to the ceremony. The four officers of arms walked in first, two by two. The garter bearing his letters patents, then the Earl of Derby, who was Edward Stanley, bearing his mantle. Then on the right hand of him, the Earl of Shrewsbury, who was Francis Talbot, bearing the rod of gold, and on the left hand, the Earl of Oxford, John de Vere, bearing the cap of estate with the crown. The Earl of Arundel, Henry Fitzalan, bearing the sword, the pommel upward. Then the said Earl of Hartford, led between the Duke of Suffolk, Henry Brandon, and the Marquess Dorset, Henry Grey. Now all these lords aforesaid being also in their robes of estate, so this would look quite magnificent. And thus in goodly order proceeding, after they entered into the chamber of presence, they made three reverent obations to the king's highness, and when they came to the cloth of estate, the lord stayed standing while Edward Seymour knelt down. Then the garter delivered the letters patents to Master Secretary William Paget. Paget then delivered them to the king, and then the king in turn handed them back to Paget and had them read them openly. The king then placed on Edward Seymour his mantle, and then put about him a band or a sash over one shoulder and under the opposite arm. Following that, he put on his cap or a crown and then delivered to Seymour his rod of gold. Following that, William Paget, the master secretary, read the patents which contained the creation of Seymour to become Duke of Somerset. With this patent, he was given a gift of a thousand pounds of land yearly, and after which Paget delivered the said letters patent to the King's Majesty, and His Highness gave them to the Duke of Somerset. And the said Duke, after thanks given to His Highness, stood on the side to assist the King's Majesty to the creation of other estates. And the rest of the lords and the officers of arms returned to conduct the other estates in like manner. So once Somerset's ceremony had concluded, they moved on to the next, in order of rank. Each man's ceremony was like that of Somerset's. With Edward Seymour being raised to Duke of Somerset, he would have been the only duke created that day. So, by rank, he was the first to go. And after Duke comes Marquess, which there was but one, William Parr, Earl of Essex. He was led between the Marquess of Dorset, Henry Grey, and the Earl of Arundel, Henry Fitzalan. He then was created Marquess of Northampton. After Marquess comes Earl. Now there were two men raised to Earl on this day. The first was John Dudley, Viscount Lyle. Dudley was led between the Earl of Derby, Edward Stanley, and the Earl of Oxford, John de Vere. He was then created Earl of Warwick. And also given the letters patent for the office of Great Chamberlain of England. This was a position that was vacated by Somerset after being created Lord Protector. Now, the second man to be raised to Earl was Thomas Risley, Lord Chancellor of England, created Earl of Southampton. Risley and Somerset had very different views, especially when it came to Somerset being Lord Protector. He did not think it right. And it should come as no surprise that not long into the new king's reign, he was relieved of his duties as Lord Chancellor and removed from the Privy Council as well. Following Risley were the newly created barons. There were four of them starting with the brother to Somerset and uncle to King Edward. Sir Thomas Seymour, at the time, was a knight. He entered in his kirtle and was led between two barons in their robes of estate, a baron before him bearing his mantle, and then the garter bearing his letters patents. As the words of Investimus, the king put on him his robes, and at the delivery of his patents to the king's majesty, in manner as we had previously said, read it, and then the king's majesty gave the said lord his letters patent, which contained the creation of him to be Lord Seymour of Sudley. And at the same time, the king's majesty delivered unto him another patent for the office of High Admiral of England. For now, for someone who's been researching Thomas Seymour for quite a while, this was a wonderful discovery. This proves that Thomas was given both titles at the same time. 
When I had first begun researching him, I had read that he was given Lord Admiral after complaining that he did not have enough power as uncle to the king. So my tip to you is keep looking until you find a contemporary report, one written during the lifetime of your subject, then you can form your own opinions from there. Anyway, following Seymour was Sir Richard Rich. Rich had the same ceremony as previously listed and was given his patent containing the creation of him to be a Baron of Parliament. He became Baron Rich of Lees. Then came in Sir William Willoughby, who was created Baron of Parham. Lastly, Edward or Edmund, I'm not sure, Sheffield was created Lord Sheffield. After that was completed, then the king restored and delivered unto Lord St. John, the title of Lord Great Master, Sir Thomas Cheney, the title of Lord Warden Treasurer of the Household, and Sir John Gage, Comptroller. Each man were presented with their staves of their offices. Then the group proceeded, all in their robes of estate, and the dukes, marquess, earls, and barons, with their caps of estate on their head, in order as they were created, to the council chamber for dinner. As they left for dinner, the trumpets began to blow. The men were led from the room by the officers of arms, who walked two by two. Then the garter led out the Duke of Somerset, who was followed by the rest of the peers. When they arrived at the dinner chamber, the peers removed their mantles and hoods and sat in their kirtles for dinner. When the second course arrived, Somerset Harold, because at the time Garter was hoarse, proclaimed all the peers newly created, with the fees given to them, to the heralds. And after dinner, the men changed into other apparel and someone to give thanks and to attend on the King's Highness and the others at their pleasure. Then that afternoon at about three o'clock, the king and the knights of the noble order of the garter gathered in the king's closet and there kept chapter. The king and the knights of the said order of the garter presented with one voice to elect the following men into the order. The Lord Marquess Dorset, the Earl of Derby, the Lord Seymour of Sudley, and Sir William Paget, secretary, and then delivered unto each of them at the same time a George and a garter, and the same time the king's majesty wore his George around his neck and his garter about his leg, which had been delivered to him by the Lord Protector. These men were able to become members of this exclusive and member-capped club due to four vacancies made that year. King Henry VIII, who had died, Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, who was degraded in the Tower of London, King Francis I of France, who had also died, and lastly, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, who was degraded and then executed. The ceremony is referenced in Jesse Child's book, The Last Victim of Henry VIII, about Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, so this references his experience, but theirs was probably similar. Immediately after being elected, they would give a speech of thanks and then kiss the cross that was offered to him. Then the garter was buckled to the left leg with these words. Sir, the most friendly companions of this order, denominated from the garter, have now admitted you their friend, brother, and companion, in faithful testimony of which they impart and give you the garter, which God grant that you deservedly receiving it may rightly wear and use to the glory of God, the honor of the most famous order and of your own. But that wasn't it. In order to officially become a knight companion, you would also need to take possession of your stall at St. George's Chapel. Now, this actually turned out to be a busy few days of ceremonies. The following day, the king left the tower for the first time since arriving and began his coronation procession through the city of London. His destination would be Westminster. The following day, his coronation would be held at Westminster Abbey. The occasion is described in the literary remains of Edward VI. On this occasion, Edward rode on horseback, his uncle, the Lord Protector, on his left side, a state canopy carried by six knights. But Edward rode a little ahead of the canopy so that the, quote, people might better see him. His Highness was richly apparelled with a gown of cloth of silver, all over embroidered with damask gold, with a girdle of white velvet wrought with Venice silver garnished with precious stones as rubies and diamonds, with true lover's knots of pearls. A doublet of white velvet, according to the same, embroidered with Venice silver, 
garnished with like stones and pearls, and a white velvet cap garnished with like stones and pearls, and a pair of buskins of white velvet. He would have looked quite sharp. At various states of his progress, pageants with speeches and songs were exhibited before him, and in St. Paul's churchyard, he was detained for a good space of time in order to watch the performance of a rope dancer, a native of Aragon, for whom a cable was stretched from the battlements of the steeple to a great anchor at the deanery gate. King Edward was quite amused. Now that night, the king appears to have slept at Whitehall. The following day was the coronation of Edward VI. It was Shrove Sunday, the 20th of February. The noblemen were summoned to be in attendance by the early hour of 7 a.m. During the ceremony, there were three crowns, each placed on the king's head, the first being King Edward's crown, followed by the imperial crown of England, and then a very rich crown which was specifically made for Edward VI. Thomas Cromner, the Archbishop of Canterbury, performed the ceremony and announced, Sirs, here I present unto you King Edward, the rightful inheritor to the crown of this realm. Wherefore all ye that be come to this day to do your homage, service, and bounden duty, by ye willing to do the same. To which all the people cried with a loud voice and said, Yay, 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 and cried, King Edward! And then they prayed, God save King Edward! Well-known Tudor Chronicle, Risley, described the events after the coronation as such. A great feast kept that day in Westminster Hall, which was richly hanged, His Majesty sitting all dinner with his crown on his head. And, after the second course served, Sir Edward de Mock came riding into the hall in clean white complete harness, richly gilded and his horse richly trapped, and cast his gauntlet to wage battle against all men that would not take him, Edward VI, for right king of his realm. And then the king drank to him and gave him a cup of gold. And after dinner the king made many knights, and then he changed his apparel, and so rode from thence to Westminster Palace. The following two days show royal joyce held at the Palace of Westminster by six challengers. These chivalric sports were witnessed by the king from the gallery. Well, that's where we'll end it for now. In the next episode, I'll try to finish the story of Edward VI. So thank you so much for joining me on this journey through history. Until next time. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Wait a second. You don't think I actually forgot to thank my patrons, did you? It's because of these wonderful people that this show is commercial free, and without their generosity, the show would not exist. If you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, go to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click become a patron. And remember, for as little as a dollar a month, you can show your support. With that, I would like to thank my current patrons. Heidi, Jennifer, Shelby, Sari, Sue, Johanna, Doris, Courtney, Bob, Diana, Rachel, Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Katie, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary, Cynthia, Melissa, Nicole, Cheryl, Carrie, Tanya, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, Megan, Pat, and Heather from the English Renaissance History Podcast. Thank you so much again for joining me. Until next time. <laughs>